and we'll go ahead and get started. Let us pray together. Almighty and ever-living God, all-wise God, all-knowing God, God that is uh, ever-present in our lives, a God that is uh, himself woven into the fabric of creation. We give you thanks and praise today, and we're especially thankful for your word and how it has been clearly revealed to us faithfully down through the centuries as a source for us about how we should think about you and how we should live our life. Father, as we explore more deeply the book of Proverbs, I will pr I pray that you give us wisdom and eyes to see how uh, these ancient um, uh, sayings written so long ago uh, have traction and meaning for our life today. So help us see that, help us live into that and realize that. This we pray in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, we've got some extra handouts. Uh, if anybody needs them, uh, we'll just, did everybody get one? Okay, I've also got slides uh, to make sure that we're tracking along. So today we're talking about Proverbs. How many chapters in Proverbs? Pop quiz, 31. By the way, that, that makes it one of the easiest, uh, if you're doing your daily Bible reading, it's one of the easiest books to read because what's today, the 14th? So you just read Proverbs 14. Tomorrow's the 15th. Read Proverbs 15. Now, I know in February there's 28 days, so you'll have to read like four on the 28th of February, 28, 29, 30, 31. That's okay. But the point is, make that, I encourage you to make that habit, a habit if you haven't done that already. So Proverbs, I want to begin uh, by reading, before I say anything about the book of Proverbs, by reading um, this first little snippet that comes from Proverbs chapter 3. Guys, welcome. We have a handout as well for those of you coming in on the table there. Happy are those who find wisdom and those who get understanding. For her income is better than silver and her revenue better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are the riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness. And all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called happy. I think this is a beautiful summary of the Proverbs and indeed wisdom and how we're going to talk a little bit about Proverbs, a lot about Proverbs. We're going to talk a little bit about wisdom too. Uh, the book of Proverbs is, of course, one of three Old Testament books in the Bible, along with Job and Ecclesiastes, which are known as wisdom literature. And really, the wisdom literature is really meant to be read uh, all three of them go together. So the Proverbs, you know, will provide these short uh, sayings that uh, provide wisdom. And then, you know, what happened, you know, Job is sort of a narrative that is answering the question, well, what about the person who is wise, who is faithful? Well, bad things happen to them as well. And Ecclesiastes also adds to the body of wisdom. The Old Testament has three basic types of literature. Last time I was here, I talked a little about, about genre and all the various types of genre. Uh, there's more genres in the Old Testament than this, but basically there's three categories. You have narrative, um, things like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Samuel, the King's books, Joshua, you know, Ruth. These are, these are books uh, of narrative, historical narrative. You have prophecy as well. That's about 30%. That includes the prophets like Ezekiel, Isaiah, right? Jeremiah. And then you have wisdom and poetry, of which Proverbs plays an important part. And in fact, many of the Proverbs are sort of designed poetically, and we'll take a look at that in just a moment. What is the overarching concern of Proverbs? You know, what's distinctive about Proverbs? Well, uh, Proverbs, as I mentioned, is not a story. It's not a narrative. So you're not going to approach reading it the same way you're going to approach reading, you know, um, 
you know, Genesis or one of the Gospels. Um, uh, they're not narrative. And so because of this, it is less concerned with something we call redemptive history. That is, most of the Old Testament is talking about, you know, God has created things. Things have broken down because of the fall. God has a plan to redeem. He makes a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He sets up his, his monarchy. And really the story of the Old Testament is this wonderful story about God's people and God's plan to redeem his people, but also uh, to bring a Messiah through which God is to bless all of the nations and ultimately uh, atone for the sins of humanity and usher in new creation. All of that is sort of the story of the Bible, right? So, but Proverbs is really not, it's part of the story, but it's really given to us as a practical way to live within that story. It's consistent with that story, but again, it's sort of a different way of, of reading as we approach it. Uh, Proverbs asks the questions, these types of questions, what kind of world are we living in? What kind of world are we living in? You know, well, The Bible tells us that the world is good, it's beautiful, um, but it's also fallen. It's also scary. There's evil in the world. There's folly. It asks the question, um, what does it look like to live the good life? That's a question that ancient philosophers like Plato and Aristotle have asked. Uh, you know, what does it mean to flourish? The Greek word for that is uh, eudaimonia, I believe it is. Um, but what does it look like to flourish in this life? Well, Proverbs are addressing these types of answers. And so as we think about the concern, overarching concern of Proverbs, it is this. It offers us a key to life, to live in this life well, to pursue living the good life, to pursue human flourishing. Derek Kidner, by the way, was an Old Testament scholar from the UK. He's got a wonderful little, if you're looking for a single volume commentary on Proverbs, I would go with his. Uh, it's an excellent little, little book. What is the purpose of Proverbs? Well, I think sometimes as we're thinking about, you know, what is the purpose of this book or that book? Well, what does the book say about its purpose? You know, let the book sort of define for us what the purpose of Proverbs is. And so I want to read uh, for you just at the very introduction of Proverbs, verses uh, uh, two through six in chapter one. This is what Proverbs is for. This is the overarching purpose, okay? And pay attention to uh, the verbs there. For learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for gaining instruction in wise dealing, righteous justice and equity. And I love this next one, to teach shrewdness to the simple, knowledge and prudence to the young. Notice that these Proverbs are both for the young, the simple, but also for the learned, right? They're for everyone. Let the wise too hear and gain in learning and the discerning acquire skill. And by the way, another way that we think about Proverbs, we're going to talk about what wisdom is and in just a minute, but it's another way of thinking about it is skill, skill in life. You know, you think about a craftsman, a carpenter, like a master carpenter who's carving something. Um, and in fact, in the Old Testament, the term uh, that we use for wisdom is used interchangeably for skill, okay? A, a skill of a master craftsman. It's taking, it's, a, it's applying that to life, having skill in life, skill in your dealings with other people, skill in your relationships, skill in your, in your sort of um, business practices, okay? All of those things. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. It's interesting. Notice verse six. One of the purposes of Proverbs is to understand a proverb. Now, what, what is it saying there? Well, here's the thing. It takes wisdom sometimes to really understand wisdom. It takes wisdom to understand wisdom. And the more that you read and reread these Proverbs, the wiser you get, the more you come back to these Proverbs, wiser, and you begin to see things that you've never seen before, okay? So what is wisdom? I wanna look a little bit uh, at the term wisdom. And Lisa, is there any way I can get a cup of water by chance? A cup of water, thanks. Um, so we're going to look at five components of wisdom. 
Um, the first is instruction. Uh, wisdom is hard won. It's not just some, you can memorize all the Proverbs, all 31, have them down memory and still not be wise. Wisdom is hard won. A quality of character as much as mine. Has anybody read Aristotle's uh, ethics, by the way? Like he, one of the things, yeah, one of the things he talks about is, you know, your habits and practices uh, in the Nicomachean ethics, like, you know, you want to take these proverbs and put them to use, develop habits and practices, right? That's how wisdom is really developed. Yes, you can memorize the proverbs. You could read them every day, but it's, it's not until they sort of sink down into your soul and you begin to flesh them out in your day-to-day lives do they become more effective. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so here, here's an example from Proverbs 1-2. For learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight. Uh, Proverbs are there to instruct us on how to live, for understanding, for insight. Second um, aspect of wisdom, wisdom is there for our understanding, the ability to discern what is right. Um, This is why I think it's so important to sort of teach sort of, I would say, virtue ethics to children. We can teach you know, Proverbs to children because we want them to understand what is right and what's wrong. And the beautiful thing about the Proverbs is as we begin to explore all 31 of them, there's all these situational issues that, that, that'll jump up you know, about you know, wise dealings in business or with family, a son to a father. What does it look to be a noble woman, right? So the Proverbs is really trying to uh, be specific in dealing with that. Proverbs 10.13. On the lips of one who has understanding, wisdom is found. So at the base level, it takes an understanding of what these Proverbs are saying, but a rod is for the back of one who lacks sense, okay? So Proverbs, uh, I'm sorry, wisdom entails understanding. Third, wise dealing, practical wisdom, good sense. Proverbs 8, verse 14. I have good advice and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. Okay, so practical wisdom. Uh, you know, this is not just some kind of abstract theological principle that's floating out there. Proverbs are meant to be, you know, be very practical in our day-to-day lives, you know? Um, so uh, this is my favorite shrewdness. Um, shrewdness we think about shrewdness, we think about negative examples of shrewdness. Um, you know, one good example is um, in the garden. Here's one, Genesis 3, during the fall. We read, now the serpent, that Satan, was more crafty. Some translations have cunning or shrewd than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? You know, in one sense, the serpent, Satan, was shrewd. There was a little, there was wisdom, you could say, built into that, right? There's just certain shrewdness. Now, this is a negative example. We're going to see that proper shrewdness is connected relationally to the God of the covenant, right? Um, but the, the shrewdness is actually, you know, part of God's design. It's part of wisdom. It's, it entails clever discernment, creative ways of dealing. Here's a positive example. Not to leave you on the negative example, Proverbs 22. A prudent, or some translations have shrewd, or clever person, foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Okay, preparing for your retirement. That's smart. That's a, there's a sense of wisdom for that. That's shrewdness. You know, trying to be creative in your, your business trying to find new clients, you know, working those rela- shrewdness. That's, that's actually a good thing. That, that can be a sort of godly way of, of, of living, right? Or maybe it's parenting. Maybe with your parenting tactics with some of your kids, you have to have a certain shrewdness about it. You know, you parented one kid this way. You got to parent this other kid this way. You have to sort of adjust your tactics. You need to be clever. You need to be creative. Read some books. Go to a counselor. Figure it out, right? Be shrewd. Be clever, right? That includes wisdom, right? 
So wisdom, you know, knowledge, understanding, instruction, but also shrewdness. It's all part of God's wisdom. Uh, lastly, knowledge. This is the one that most people think of. Uh, knowledge is important. Knowledge in and of itself is insufficient, of course. This is not necessarily an informed mind, intellectual knowledge, but rather a knowledge of the truth and knowledge of God. And that last component is really essential. Knowledge of God. We're going to look at that in just a second. But let's look at Proverbs 2, verse 5. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. If we really want to understand, have wisdom, we're going to see this in a moment, we need to be connected to the God of the covenant, the creator God, the redeemer God. You see, that's, that's the foundational thing that we need to truly be wise. Proverbs 3, verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge him. Uh, no, notice that the word acknowledge, the root word there is what? To know, to know him, to acknowledge him, and he will make your path, your, um, make straight your paths. So knowledge uh, of the Proverbs, of their theology, of their teaching, but really knowledge of God, a relational knowledge with God. Okay? So these are some aspects of wisdom. Let me just recap real quick. So we said wisdom involves instruction, understanding, wise dealing, shrewdness, and knowledge. Got that? That should all be in your, your handout. And now I want to take a look just briefly and look at, um, you know, we think about these, the, you know, proverbs of like, oh yeah, it's a collection of ancient sayings that were given to us. Okay, and they tell us how to live. Okay, fair enough. But I want to, I want to argue that, that wisdom is much bigger than that. Ontologically, it's much bigger. And I'm going to argue that wisdom is actually woven into the fabric of creation. Okay? So let's look here. Uh, uh, Proverbs 8. This is all referring, when it says me, it's referring to wisdom. The Lord created me, that is wisdom, at the beginning of his work. Okay? the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I, that is wisdom, was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth when there was no depths, I was brought forth. Then there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I, that is wisdom, was brought forth when he had not yet made the earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I, wisdom, was there. Wisdom is older than creation itself, you see. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not regress his command. When he marked out the fa foundations of the earth, then I was beside him. Wisdom was there. Like a master worker, and I was daily his delight. Playing before him always, playing in his inhabited world. You see, wisdom is before creation. It's part of creation, and it plays. Wisdom plays in the inhabited world and delighting in the human race. So, uh, here's another verse from Hebrews, or I'm sorry, Hebrews, uh, I just preached on Hebrews, so, last service, okay. Proverbs, Proverbs 3. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. So you could ar almost argue that, yes, God speaks ex nihilo things into creation, but he creates by wisdom. His creating was a wise act. By understanding, again, another sort of uh, term that's linked with wisdom, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths broke open, the clouds dropped down in dew. You see, what I want us to see is that wisdom is part of God's creation from the very beginning. And if you go outside, you know, I just spent um, a week in the mountains of North Carolina. 
and I spent a week at the beach uh, in South Carolina. I sort of feel like I'm just coming back on vacation. But you know, you go out, go out in the mountains. If you go to Colorado, wherever you go, I know you're getting ready to go. To, have you been up to? You been hunting in Canada yet? Friday. Okay, so you're going to see some of the beautiful parts of God's creation up there, man. Right? I mean, just going to the mountains. Wow, there's wisdom in the things God created. When I'm at the beach and I see the, the ocean. And I feel so small. Can't you see God's wisdom? It's beautiful, but there's wisdom there. You see, man, it just blows blows my mind. Wisdom is part of God's creation from the very beginning. Now, the interesting thing is God has also created human beings to be part of that universe. So how does one live so as to be part in tune with the natural order of things that God has created? Uh, that is the one of the key questions of wi- wisdom literature. Since wisdom is part of the fabric of creation, right? It's embedded in the natural world. We are part of that creation. How do we live in tune with God's creation? And how we do that is sort of whether we do that faithfully or wisely determines whether or not we're, we're being wise or living a life of folly. Um. Because wisdom is part of the created order, there are some paths that follow God's intended design and others that do not. You see that? There are some paths that follow part of God's design and some that do not. The wise person will seek those paths that are part of God's design and follow them. Okay? So the other thing I want us to see is wisdom is an attribute of God's uh, character. We've seen that wisdom was prior to creation. Wisdom was involved in creation. Wisdom is still part of the natural order. It's woven into the fabric of creation. But wisdom is also an attribute of God himself. Here's something from Psalm 104. It's not a proverb, but nevertheless, I think it speaks to what we're talking about. Oh Lord, how manifold are your works. Talking about the creation. In wisdom, you have made them. The earth is full of your creatures. Again, um, God creates through wisdom, but God has wisdom. It's part of his attributes. Okay, so that's a little questions about wisdom so far. We talked about sort of different aspects of wisdom. We talked about it precedes creation. It's part of creation. Okay, it's an attribute of God. All right, let's look at the motto of Proverbs. Um, the motto of Proverbs comes in the very first chapter, verse 7. It's one of the most widely quoted Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord, you see, has a relational dimension to it. It entails a sense of awe, an overwhelming sense of reverence to the Lord. It is deeply relational, and it entails submitting to his word as our Lord. It is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of knowledge. The term beginning here refers not just to a start of something, not just a first step of something, but rather has in mind a controlling principle. You see that? So that's all to say, if we really want to gain wisdom, we begin with a deep connection, relational connection with the Lord. You see? Um, And so in this sense, uh, I would say, Relationship precedes ethics. Relationship precedes ethics. If we want to live the good life, ethics about how we live, the decisions we make, the choices we make. If we want to have good decisions, make good choices, we begin, the controlling principle of that is a robust fear of the Lord, a healthy, growing, thriving relationship with the God of wisdom. Okay? Okay, the fear of the Lord is the foundation, the root cause of wisdom. Here again, relationship with God precedes ethics. 
So Job, which is one of the wisdom books, it's sort of long. It's, it can be sort of a hard read, but I encourage you to read it as well. And he said, that is God said to humankind, truly the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. So I want to look a little bit about the structure of the book of Proverbs now. We've talked a little bit about wisdom. Let's look now back at Proverbs. So we first we have the preamble, and I've touched upon a bit of that. Really, I think verses 1 through 7 is going to shape how you read the rest of Proverbs. Okay, that's sort of what we would call the hermeneutical key. Hermeneutics is the science of interpretation. It's a big fancy word I learned in seminary. Um, but anyway, that's all to say it's the key. It's the lens through which we read the rest of the book. Does that make sense? Um, then we have a father's praise, uh, chapter 1, verse 8, through uh, really the rest of chapter 9. And that's really the heart of Proverbs, I think, chapters 1 through 9. Um, the rest you get into, the rest is great, but you know, definitely, obviously, read it through um, chronologically. Uh, then in chapter 10, uh, Proverbs of Solomon. Then we get into, uh, that should be, um, I don't know my chapters are lining up here. Words of Wise Men, chapters 22 through 24. Uh, further Proverbs of Solomon, chapters 25 through 29. Words of Argur, chapter 30. Who, who in the world is Argur? You know, so Argur... Um, Arger's this guy, he begins by his, really, with ignorance and folly. And he realizes, if you read this, that he's not a wise person at all. He needs help. By the way, raise your hand. I, I identify with Arger, right? <laughs> he, he's like so ignorant. He's full of folly. He's like, I really need God's wisdom. Then Arger discovers that divine wisdom is revealed in the scriptures. Oh my gosh, it's here. It's in the Bible. I can go there. And so... Arger really becomes a model reader of the Proverbs. Someone who knows they need God's wisdom. Someone who knows that they're fallen. Guys, come on, everybody. We're, right, we're, we're all Argers here. But then he realizes, he has this great epiphany. Oh, I can go to God's word and I can learn. Um, so Arger's great. And then uh, words of King uh, Lemuel. And he is sort of a secular king. Um, he's a non-Israelite king, uh, but he passes along wisdom that was given to him by his mom, actually. And um, uh, this was wisdom about being a wise and noble leader. So if you're looking at sort of Proverbs that deal with like leadership, this could be a good place to look. Uh, Proverbs 31 verses 1 through 9. And then we get to the noble woman. Uh, verses 10 through 31. Many of y'all, you know, I've heard it said, you know, I want to be a Proverbs 31 wife. Has anybody ever heard that? Or, you know, it's sometimes a phrase that's said. You know, it's about really being a noble woman. And the cool thing about uh, this poem in chapter 31, 10 through 31, it's an acrostic. So every line begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. A, B, C, D, Hebrew version of that, right? And so it's in this acrostic that goes. Um, so that's that's how Hebrews uh, concludes. But what's interesting, I think, also is Hebrews begins with imparting knowledge of a father to a son. It ends in chapter 31 with a mom imparting wisdom to her son. Isn't that interesting? So you have the, the dad imparting wisdom, you know, at the very beginning, and then it ends with a mom imparting wisdom in chapter 31. So this is kind of cool, beautiful bookend, I think, to Proverbs.